Hello, folks, and welcome to another episode of Virtual Legality. I'm your host, Richard Hogue, managing member of the Hogue Law Business Law Firm of Northville, Michigan. And for those that are new here in these parts, I am a mergers and acquisitions slash venture capital attorney that has gone through quite a few deals <clears throat> in my day. And so I want to talk to you all a little bit about the big news that happened at Microsoft and Activision Blizzard just yesterday. So if you didn't see this, this is going to be a little bit of a Hangouts and Headlines type video because I don't have a lot of legal analysis to bring to the table here other than my understanding of mergers. But I want to talk about how this is being reported. I want to talk about responses to this and hopefully for folks to get a little bit better understanding of what's happening and why in the context of the video game industry and Microsoft Activision Blizzard. So with that said, let's look at the top line item, and it's a big one. Microsoft lays off 1,900 staff from its video game workforce, a report from IGN, but detailed in a memo from Phil Spencer, the head of gaming at Xbox, it's been a little over three months since the Activision, Blizzard, and King teams joined Microsoft. As we move forward in 2024, the leadership of Microsoft Gaming and Activision Blizzard is committed to aligning on a strategy and an execution plan with the sustainable cost structure that will support the whole of our growing business. Together, we've set priorities, identified areas of overlap, and ensured that we are all aligned on the best opportunities for growth. And if you hear that and you hear just business mumbo jumbo, I don't blame you, but there's a lot of things we can take out of this particular context that we're going to talk about in just a minute. As part of this process, we have made the painful decision to reduce the size of our gaming workforce by approximately 1,900 roles out of the 22,000 people on our team. The gaming leadership team and I are committed to navigating this process as thoughtfully as possible. The people who are directly impacted by these reductions have all played an important part in the success of Activision Blizzard, ZeniMax, and the Xbox teams, and they should be proud of everything they've accomplished here. We are grateful for all of the creativity, passion, and dedication they have brought to our games, our players, and our colleagues. We will provide our full support to those who are impacted during the transition, including severance benefits in informed by local employment laws. Those whose roles will be impacted will be notified, and we ask that you please treat your departing colleagues with the respect and compassion that is consistent with our values. And one thing I want to say here in this space in virtual legality is that respect and compassion is effectively mandatory. We should all have respect and compassion for each other as human beings. And I would ask certainly that we have that same respect and compassion in our chat or in our discussions and as we talk about these folks that lost their jobs and their livelihoods. If you've been here for a while, you know that I am very, very much in favor of entrepreneurship and dreamers and dreaming. And I love to see people go after their dreams and folks that make video games for us, these things that I love in this industry that I love are perhaps more dreamers than anything else, right? They've left jobs that are potentially more secure, poten potentially more lucrative to go and make products that you and I love. And so when we talk about 1,900 people losing their jobs, I'm going to talk about the economics and the law of all this and how it happens and why. We don't have to put aside our humanity and forget that these are people that are going through a very tough time and we can have that empathy and sympathy for them. Looking ahead, we'll continue to invest in areas that will grow our business and support our strategy of bringing more games to more players around the world. Although this is a difficult moment for our team, I'm as confident as ever in your ability to create and nurture the game stories and worlds that bring players together. Phil, Phil Spencer. So that's the commentary that he made. This is something that upset a lot of people. Obviously, the 1,900 people losing their jobs, but also people that follow the gaming industry. And one of the things I wanted to say about all this is that this is bad, right? Folks have read some of my notes, have looked at the playlist about the murders and acquisitions side of things, the Activision purchase, what happened with them in California before that, and said, Rick is championing this merger. He wants it to happen. And while I think it's a good thing for capital to get involved and to be invested in things like the purchase of Activision in order to compete between Microsoft and Sony, it was always going to be the case that individuals that make games, that do these things, that provide the office support at Activision, were going to have to get potentially re-evaluated as part of the merger and acquisition process. Unfortunately, I've been through this a lot and there are no really good ways to do it, right? Like a breakup or anything else that you have uh, a high level of emotion in your conversations and relating to people with, it's just not a thing that can be done in an easy process. You can, you can do things better than others and some companies really don't give a crap, but I have no reason to believe that's the case here with Microsoft. And certainly they're making the right sounds with this commentary to suggest that this was a hard decision and that they 
come to this over a period of time. I think one thing to note is that this isn't moment one of the merger, right? This isn't something that happened on day two of Activision Blizzard joining the Microsoft family. This is something that management at Microsoft looked over for a number of months and does reflect a change in leadership style at Microsoft from when they purchased ZeniMax. Now, obviously, ZeniMax was a smaller deal. It seems funny to say for only $8 billion instead of $70 billion, uh, but it was a smaller deal. But we saw them kind of live a little bit more independently and published by themselves a little bit more than we are likely to see with Activision with some of these cuts. But that being said, it doesn't mean that this isn't a traumatizing process for these people to go through. And I will say this as well, that when you're in it, when you're when you're in that situation, when you've got layoffs happening around you, it feels like the sky is falling, whether or not you're hit by that sky or not. So I would ask for kindness and compassion for not just the folks that are fired, who obviously deserve it, but even the folks that remain at Xbox and Activision Blizzard King and ZeniMax and Bethesda and everyone else that's kind of in this family, these 22,000 people, the 20,000 that survived this are still going to have uh, some thoughts about how this is all happening. So that's what I would like to put out there into the world from this video and with this chat. And hopefully that can get spread across more and more folks on social media and the internet because there's a lot of anger, there's a lot of animosity, there's a lot of emotion out there. And I just think we can understand things better while still having sympathy and understanding for our fellow human beings. So I love games, I love the people that make games. And this is a bad day for them, even if I think from an economics and legal perspective, this makes sense from what we know about both the industry, the economy, and what happens after mergers. So we're going to talk about why it makes sense and why we shouldn't look at Microsoft as evil or mustache twirling for doing this, but that doesn't mean these people aren't tremendously affected. So with that in mind, let's talk about what a corporation is, right? Because I think people have problems with this. I got a lot of commentary on my Twitter about capitalism being something that we should reevaluate and potentially take down as a result of these kinds of things. I was retweeted Elizabeth Warren, senator in the United States, saying these 1900 jobs being lost is why the FTC should have blocked the deal and should now try to unwind the deal and various of these things. So let's talk about what a corporation is first and foremost. So a corporation is a legal fiction, right? And if you're not familiar with that phrase, it means it's not real. It doesn't exist. You can't touch a corporation. You can't drive to Microsoft's house. You can drive to their headquarters but you can't drive to what Microsoft is because it's ephemeral. It's a creature of statute. It doesn't exist. So what it means in reality, and this is what modern capitalism is, and we're not going to get into government regulations or anything like that, but what it means in reality is that it's a pile of money. It's money that people have given to this pile to be managed by other people in an effort to make that pile of money grow. And you don't have to like that. You don't have to be a big fan of that system, but it is the system that has resulted in the most media, television, movies, and the existence of video games in the history of mankind. And I think that is worth a piece of the discussion here. And I think I have the flag up that says, sometimes we talk about politics in this area. I don't consider this to be a terribly political statement, but certainly capitalism and discussions around economic systems is something that happens on Twitter with maybe not as much information as I would like to see. So with that being said, it's a pile of money that's given by other people. You might be familiar with the movie, Other People's Money. That's the reference is, we hear that as investors or stockholders and we see people complain about stockholders wanting to see the number go up or the line go up on their stock price. And that is true, but that's just the mechanisms we use to incentivize and encourage management of this pile of money to be aimed in the same direction as the people that gave that money to them. Said another way, this is not Phil Spencer's money to mess around with. This is not Satya Nadella's money to do whatever they please with. So even if they want to employ 22,000 of their friends, if they look at a situation where they've got too many people doing too little things or they can increase efficiencies or they can look at a way to organize the company that they think is the best and most efficient way to produce the products and services that they want to produce, it's incumbent on them both legally and morally to go and look to see how they can make those efficiencies happen. And when you have a merger of two companies, especially one that's as big as Activision Blizzard King that was publishing games on its own, then Microsoft, another publisher, is going to have certain jobs and roles that it was already doing with the people that it had hired and that Activision Blizzard King then represents a redundant interest in, right? So this is one of the problems you have when you buy whole companies 
like this is that you have those redundancies and it's not fair to the people that used to have those jobs. I'm not going to tell you that it is. But from a legal perspective and from an economic perspective, if you think Microsoft times Activision Blizzard King can pre predominantly release the same number of games and have the same level of support uh, as the two companies separated, then having fewer people responsible for doing those things is a net benefit to the wealth of society, right? Not to these individual people, not to these individual people. But if I can make a, a an automobile or if I can make a pizza using 80% of the workforce that the two companies separated used to make it, then in general, the law wants to encourage those things. It's one of the reasons why as part of this playlist, I talked about how kind of nonsensical the arguments about labor protection were coming from the FTC and from some of the senators in their letter, because antitrust law is designed around protecting the consumer. So the notion is that if it takes fewer people to make these things and put them out into the market, there's going to be a downward pressure on prices and ultimately come down to the consumer at a more efficient economic level. And labor is essentially the opposite side of that. Doesn't make it right for the people that are affected, again. But when we talk about efficiencies, when we say this is how antitrust law works, this is why mergers are seen as sometimes positive, part of that is if we can make that pizza, if we can make that video game, that car with fewer people, then that's a lower cost input to making that thing and ultimately a downward price pressure on the market overall. You don't have to love it, but that's the way that this is all organized. And that's the, what Microsoft and management is aimed at with these kinds of things. And so a lot of this is going to be talking about a merger happening and evaluating redundancies. That's why you see this reference to areas of overlap and ensure that we're aligned on the best opportunities for growth, which is business speak for we've got too many people doing the same job and we're going to cut some of those people off because then a leaner, meaner corporation, in this case, Xbox gaming within Microsoft, is gonna be better capable of competing with Sony and Nintendo and the publishers that are otherwise out there. And we're gonna be in the best position to grow that pile of money, yes, but also potentially our overall enterprise for more jobs long-term. Now, you don't have to believe that they're right there. You don't have to believe that this was the right decision. One thing that we can't tell from the outside is whether this is the right move for Microsoft. This is a certain amount of trust and management that Phil and Satya and everybody else are doing the right thing. But you don't have to trust that. You don't have to believe it. They might have fired too many people. They might have fired too few. They might have fired the wrong 1900, right? And the folks at these companies are going to know a little bit better about whether or not the ax came down in a efficient or poor fashion and was just sometimes random and didn't realize who was doing the best work in these spaces. And that's part of the trauma that the folks that survive at these companies are going to have. Uh, but we can't speak on that from the outside. We just know that these kinds of things do happen with mergers. And we're going to talk about why, even though I just talked about redundancies, it's not all that's happening here. It's because it makes sense for Microsoft from a corporate perspective and, and from a cold corporate perspective, right, to put all the bad news on one day, right? So it's not just redundancies. It's not just the merger transactions that they did yesterday. They combined what seems to be a couple of quarters worth of changes into one day because corporations in general like to rip the Band-Aid off at once. Now, again, you don't have to like that. I don't tend to like that. I, I think it's a little bit um, of not giving the people that are going to be fired yesterday for things that are unrelated to the merger, really, uh, the spot in the, 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 spot in the uh, spotlight that they deserve. But ultimately, that's not the most important thing when we talk about these particular issues. The second thing that happened yesterday, and I got a lot of questions about this, was that a couple of folks at Blizzard leadership left, right? So as part of the layoffs, IGN reports, Blizzard Entertainment President Mike Ibarra announced he's leaving the company. Ibarra, a former Xbox executive, joined Blizzard in 2019. And I think that's an important part of the story. IGN doesn't really expound upon it, but understand what Mike Ibarra's situation was, right? He worked at Microsoft for a long, long time, he finally left to join Blizzard. He gets elevated all the way up to running Blizzard. And then Microsoft buys his company, his parent company, and he's brought back into the Microsoft fold. So if you've ever worked for someone for a long time, finally decided to move out, and then got dragged back into that earlier situation, you can understand why 
there might be some consternation, culture clash, personality clash, lingering resentments, whatever it might be for that person coming back to the company that they left not that long ago, five years ago. So Mike Ibarra is one of the faces of Blizzard. And I think a lot of people were surprised to see him, quote unquote, fired yesterday. But it was immediately apparent just from his statement, and we'll take a look at that in just a second, that he wasn't necessarily fired. So he says, I want to thank everyone who is impacted today for their meaningful contributions to their teams, to Blizzard and to players' lives. It's an incredibly hard day, and my energy and support will be focused on all those amazing individuals impacted. This is in no way a reflection on your amazing work. Note that that's the same message Phil sent out, right? This is a layoff. This isn't a firing for substandard work. If there's anything I can help with, connections, recommendations, etc., direct message me. To the Blizzard community, I also want to let you all know today is my last day at Blizzard. Leading Blizzard through an incredible time and being part of the team, shaping it for the future ahead, was an absolute honor. Having already spent 20 plus years at Microsoft and with the acquisition of Activision Blizzard behind us, it's time for me to once again become Blizzard's biggest fan from the outside. To the incredible teams at Blizzard, thank you. Words can't express how I feel about all of you. You are amazing. Continue to do incredible things and always keep Blizzard blue and the player at the forefront of every decision. To all of those impacted today, I am always available to you and understand how challenging today's news is. My heart is with each one of you. And I think that's a good note, but you'll note that it doesn't make clear that he was fired. In fact, by separating it out into thank you for everyone and then I'm leaving, it sounds like it's voluntary. And indeed, as this kind of filtered out, and I always caution folks as they read these things to let them percolate for a minute because a lot of the on the ground reporting when things happen immediately is maybe a little bit inaccurate. And sometimes that can happen here in virtual legality or hangouts and headlines as well. So always take a beat, especially with a developing story. But if we follow along with this one, we see that Mike Ibarra's note, which is here, ultimately becomes, it was great to be a part of the team that built Blizzard and Activision over the years. I've decided to transition out now that it's merging with Microsoft and happy to have helped that succeed. I'll be taking time out for a bit to spend time with family and travel the world. Afterwards, we'll look for hyper growth opportunities with great teams. Now that's very management speaky, right? And I don't know how you feel about Mikey Barra. I certainly have no strong feelings one way or the other. We have interacted on Twitter and social media from time to time, but this is an individual who one, we know is voluntarily leaving and not being fired. And certainly one can understand that when the parent company has come in and swooped out 2,000 people, a lot of which were working at your company, Blizzard, at the time, that this is a good time for you to leave. But I would also say from a messaging perspective, in the midst of 2,000 people leaving, it's maybe not the best time to announce your cruise plans. And certainly, I think that's reflected in some of the salty language we see on Twitter, right? Uh, this is one such person shows who he really is. Don't let this be forgotten. This is how the leader exited the company while so many of his employees are crying and broken and scared with a little extra message there at the bottom. So I think there's a lot of that going around. There's a lot of anger. There's a lot of emotion. I don't think this is the right way to present this, but I also don't think it's insincere. I think this is someone rattling off a quick message on, I think this is Instagram. Uh, I'm not quite sure with all the social media outposts out there, but um it's clear that he voluntarily left. And again, that makes sense in the context here, which is to say these are massive changes at the company. Uh, and that's the kind of thing that we would expect management to leave. You, you have too many cooks in the kitchen at Xbox as it is. You're bringing in all of Activision's and it's a, not unexpected for some folks to say, I don't want to be a part of Microsoft, especially one that worked there for 20 years before. All right. Now I want to talk a little bit about unions because I think that's an interesting part of the conversation. We talked about folks that are down with capitalism about all this, which is certainly their position to have. I don't think that's necessarily the right position with respect to the existence of video games. But the secondary part of this is unionization, which of course is a story that we've been following in virtual legality and around the video game industry for some time. And the CWA, which has been the primary union organizer for various quality assurance teams across the country, including the ZeniMax workers, uh, had a few things to say. Layoffs in the video game industry are becoming the norm, even at companies that continue to deliver huge profits. We'll talk more about that later as well. It hurts to see our coworkers who are so passionate about this work, who actually make these video game companies so successful, be the first impacted by any cuts or layoffs at work. Companies will claim that we're all a family, but a family doesn't lay off or outsource people. Kirk Ferentz, hardest hit, which is a college football reference. Just leave it be. It's clear that one way or the other, the only way forward is for all of us to come together as workers to protect each other. 
Union representation can't always protect against layoffs, but through union representation and the bargaining process, video game workers can establish greater transparency in policies, including layoff protections. Now, to some extent, this is true. And I, as I've said a lot in this space, unions are great, or more specifically, unions can be great. And everyone should evaluate whether that's what they want for their bargaining process uh, at a video game company or any other industry. But it's no surprise in the midst of a huge layoff announcement like this one that the unions with their feet most in the door at video game companies say this is a great time to advocate for our unions. In my experience, unionization doesn't prevent layoffs really at all. It changes the process and potentially uh, exactly how they are carried out by the company. But in general, from an economic perspective, increasing friction with labor and increasing labor costs is not exactly going to protect folks from instances like this, where they have a huge merger and acquisition. That doesn't mean that it's not the right thing for other reasons. It's not. It doesn't mean it's not the right thing for people to consider. But this, to me, looks more like a union jumping on the opportunity to message about itself and say, hey, people join the union, which is fine. That's what you'd expect a union to do. Uh, but that's where I see that story really playing out long term. So we've talked about what a corporation is. We've talked about mergers and redundancies. We've talked about efficiencies. We've talked about unionization, capitalism. I also want to add one last note, which is a lot of notes that I received was that uh, people need to be essentially last on the firing line, right? That you want folks that will be cut last only if the company is going bankrupt or folks that need medicine or otherwise dealing with disabilities to be last on the firing line, even if you are going to fire people. And one of the things I would say to folks in this space about that is that that can seem like compassion, right? That can seem like you want these people to succeed. You want companies to have more employees and to work longer. You point to Nintendo and say, look, the CEO lowered his salary instead of firing folks. And to some extent, that's a part of Japanese culture and law. But putting that aside for just a second, one thing that happens there is that with that compassion, you often make it more difficult to get those people hired in the first place, right? One of the things that happens with Nintendo and Japanese companies is that they are understaffed for what we would think of as a Western video game company or a tech company. And that's because when you make it very difficult or impossible to fire people, then that hiring process becomes much more difficult and fraught and less likely to actually happen. So when we have these conversations, the first order feeling good kind of solution of, okay, don't fire people that have disabilities is fine, but we also have to think through the implications of that because we aren't just looking at one data point. We aren't just looking at one moment in time. We're looking at all of the times that these can happen. And if fewer people are hired, then are we really better off either as an industry or for those people that don't get hired because it's not plausible for the company to hire them. So we have to have those conversations, which are complicated and sad, and we still have to have sympathy for all the people involved. And you can see why these are real conversations that have to be had in boardrooms and in legislative halls and not so much in 180 characters on Twitter. So my apologies that it can't be shorter and less complex or less nuanced than that, but I think there's a lot of things to think through when we talk about these issues. And the next thing I wanted to mention, because I know I promised that I would, is that this is not just about redundancies. This is not just about folks that are doubled up on from Activision, uh, as we've seen from some of the kind of leaks that come out as we look at these issues. So here's Jazz at Windows Central saying, multiple sources tell me that Microsoft is laying off the entire internal customer support teams for Activision Blizzard game games, save a few. Microsoft will outsource the rest to external companies abroad. Activision was one of the few game pubs with high quality internal customer support team. And I would classify that that kind of move as something that got lumped in with the merger stuff, but is at least merger adjacent, which is to say Microsoft appears to be unifying its approach to something like customer support across what it already does for its enterprise software and current video game setup, right? Which is outsourced customer support. And you don't have to like that. I don't like it. Uh, but that also makes a certain amount of logistical sense that Microsoft wants to be one company and not have different ways to handle these things at just the different companies that it purchased. Continuing with Jez's comments, Microsoft has also shut down departments dedicated to bringing Xbox games to physical retail, which could be some redundancies, but not necessarily. Which if you've seen the digital only Xbox console leaks, well, you can get an idea of where Microsoft is going here. A huge amount of community managers have also lost their jobs across the company. That's one of the 
kind of lists of folks that I saw across my timeline yesterday was a lot of community management, social media type folks, especially on the Bethesda side. Less community building for Xbox games in Microsoft's future, it seems like. Note, he says, reducing retail teams doesn't confirm Microsoft is quitting physical retail for Xbox games yet. They can outsource and might already have capacity, it should be noted, and might be consolidating here. So don't run with Xboxes quitting physical based on this. And I do always appreciate when folks go out there and try to help explain the headlines and cut off some of the console warring and other stuff that we see on social media. That's certainly the idea of virtual legality. I think Jez does a good job here. Don't just jump with they're getting out of physical, even if we're seeing closures happen otherwise. The other thing that was mentioned by a lot of folks was that the unnamed survival game that Blizzard was making was canceled and the team appears to have all been fired. And how could I talk about back office redundancies and things when that happens? And the one thing I would add to that, excuse me, uh, is that this particular game appears to be one that did overlap with some of the things that Microsoft was doing and appeared to have engine and other issues related to it. So again, Microsoft kind of took a taking care of all family business approach to the announcements yesterday, and some things got lumped in with others. But even with 100 people making this particular game, it doesn't make it to 2,000 folks if we're not talking about redundancies, administration, and whatnot, which we saw in various other places. Here's Andy Robinson highlighting a reset era or reset era uh, post from November of last year. And this is a person that's seemingly against the merger, but calculates it pretty accurately. Okay, but the vast majority of the people that will lose their job here are just average Joes trying to make a living. Activision has 9,800 employees. GNA, which is your general and administrative expenses, is typically about 20% of the headcount. So we're looking at about 1,960 redundancies, probably more once it all gets folded into Microsoft. And again, this was not just redundancies yesterday. So it looks like Microsoft kept a little bit of the administration and maybe fired some other folks and teams that were unrelated specifically to administrative expenses. But You'll note here that that number is very close to where it wound up. That Andy notes it from VGC as well. And you'll also note, because it's reset era, that this user was apparently banned either now or at the time that they made this statement. So yeah, don't share this video on reset era, folks. You can get banned for sharing virtual legalities over there. Uh, but anywhere else you want to share it is totally fine with me. And so I think with that said, I wanted to take questions and comments. I love doing these shows live and having this comment period because... I can't promise that I've thought of everything that you might have questions or interest in talking about. So let's talk about them in the chat. And thank you so much to everyone for being here. If that concludes your visit to virtual legality, if you want to like and subscribe on the way out, please do. I always appreciate it. We've also got links below to support the channel if you want to do that. If you don't want to do that, that's fine as well. And if you want to super chat, I can spot those for questions and comments. If you want to just mark it as at Hogue Law or otherwise, I can potentially spot those as well. So as Parallax Abstraction says here, you can get banned on Reset Era for having a pulse. I think they were mad at me in on Reset Era for interviewing one of the developers of Hogwarts Legacy. I believe that's where that stems from, but I can't quite remember for sure. Sardisms asks, do you think Microsoft will offer extended severance or healthcare like for six months to help optics and long-term employee satisfaction? I honestly don't know. I, my instinct is no. If you look at the specific quote from Phil, he talks about severance benefits, but informed by local employment laws, which sounds a lot to me like we're going to do what's required of us, but not necessarily more. Uh, and so we'll, we'll see how that goes long term, but I wouldn't suspect that it'll be super long term on that. I expect it to match what Microsoft would have offered its prior company, either at Xbox or its enterprise software folks. Um, and I guess the last thing I did want to mention that I forgot to, so let's go back just one step before we dive directly into this, is that folks talking about the merger and the merger being bad on this are perhaps not giving you the full understanding of what's happening in industries across the country. And I wanted to point people to an essay that I found very informative from Matthew Ball. If you don't know Matthew Ball, he was an analyst, I believe, at Amazon that worked with Amazon Media and TV, and he did an article called The Tremendous Yet Troubled State of Gaming in 2024 that talks about 2023's awesome video games. And he is a man of high taste and talent, saying Alan Wake 2 was his personal favorite, which of course was my game of the year last year. But more importantly for our conversations here, it was a bad year for the gaming industry employment side of things. For those who worked in gaming last year, it was brutal. Unfortunately, 2024 
has seen a huge number of cuts in only 25 days. And it's important to note that this is the start of the calendar year that's going to focus a lot of folks on readjusting how they run their businesses. And that's one of the reasons this happens, but it's still a huge number. These layoffs went deep too. Niantic cut roughly one in four employees. Epic Games cut 16% of its staff. Unity laid off 15% last year. Riot dropped 11%. CD Projekt Red shed 10 10%. 10%, And Microsoft Gaming, the guys we're talking about today, but last year, lost 8.6% and Bungie 8% with the A at 6. And Ubisoft didn't otherwise give numbers so precisely. There are several reasons behind the many layoffs detailed above, but the first may be the most important. It's also the most overlooked and most counter-narrative. Video game revenues are falling. And there's a lot of detail here, and I would point people to this article. I'm sorry I can't give the links in the description of these videos any longer because YouTube has sent me a bunch of nasty grams saying it doesn't like outside links, even to places that are perfectly safe. So one of the things I'm looking at doing is having the links presented in places like the podcast uh, website that we've set up so that you can go and follow these videos in podcast format, talk to AI Rick and everything else we've we've mentioned prior in virtual legality. Uh, but if I can set that up correctly, I can put the links there and hopefully with one external link that YouTube can can get over itself with, we can get you the information that I like to have. But if you look up Matthew Ball, you'll see this article. Compared to 2021, spending in 2023 is down 4.1%. Compared to 2020, Revenues are up only 2% with an anemic 0.7% compound annual growth rate. And those are not great numbers, obviously, but we're still, those numbers are really bad in a time that has seen 40 year highs in inflation. So what you're looking at is an industry that has huge increases in its per head cost, the costs of actually employing people, less revenues from the products it's selling after the pandemic, and is now looking at potentially getting rid of folks that were hired during the pandemic when the, the plot line for what they thought the video game industry would be is very, very different. And in that economy, all those things affect industries that are not just video games. You can only go on social media and see all the problems that media and writing are having. You can see Taylor Lorenz talking about the destruction of all mainstream media and various other things. And so one of the things we have to think about when we talk about the merger in the 1900 and, and what folks are saying about what would happen after Activision Blizzard King was hired is that we don't have the counterfactual, right? We don't have what happens if they don't get purchased. And in this particular case, it looks like Activision Blizzard King would have had to have shed people uh, by the notions of everyone else losing people over the course of the past few years. And it might well have been worse, but we don't know for sure one way or the other. The point is that the merger doesn't happen as a, in a vacuum. And no one anywhere, to my knowledge, was saying that the merger would act as some kind of bulwark or shield against the normal effects of the economy on a Microsoft, an Activision Blizzard King or otherwise. So I do encourage people to read through things that are based on economics and the context of what all this is happening in. But I don't know that you need a, a, a heavy hand to tell you that the economy has been going through some things and that layoffs are happening across multiple industries. So with that said, now let's get more formally to questions and comments. I do apologize for the little beat into uh, uh, other things while we already started questions and comments, but I'm glad we got to talk about it. Googleman, thank you so much for the super chat here. 50,000 layoffs when Midjourney version 10 releases. I, I mean, it's possible, right? We don't know exactly what generative AI is going to do to all these various industries. One other thing that Matthew Ball points out in that article that is happening though, is that some of the downward pressure on labor costs that should be happening when you have all those layoffs and you have a, a, a large talent pool that then is then available is not happening because a lot of the folks that have video game experience are being hired up by what we might call serious software uh, companies that are making generative AI or working in big tech more specifically than just video games. And so there isn't that downward pressure on that headcount price that is what we might expect in a normal kind of glut of labor availability. So I do think that generative AI is one of those areas where you can see the artists getting concerned, but really folks that are getting concerned across all of the tech board, as it were. And it might happen when there are more advances in that generative AI space. And again, from the cold corporate lawyer standpoint, I know a lot of people on Twitter think of me that way. If you can get the same game done for $100 million instead of $300 million overall, that's a good. But it doesn't mean it's good for the people that are no longer employed or making money or, or feeding their family. 
it, it means it's good for overall the consumer market and getting more products and services out to that market for less work, right? The goal is not work. These companies are not jobs programs. The goal is getting products and services and services out and the more efficient you do that, the better off they are, the better off competition is and the better off the consumer market is. So goes the economic theory. You don't have to agree with that. You can definitely uh, argue some of those points from an economic standpoint, but certainly that's the way the law is written and that's the way economics has been borne out since the industrial revolution, really. The rambling gamer guy, question. Do you think that this is a continuing trend in the games industry of cutting down bloated teams from the pandemic? Riot just laid off 11% of its staff, 50% of the TMNT last Robin team as well. Yes, I think I addressed that after I started questions and comments, uh, but yes, I think it is definitely a continuing trend. But I think one of the things I said on my Twitter yesterday that got some people upset was that I don't believe this is time to start ringing alarm bells, really. You can say that the management decisions were poor during the pandemic by assuming certain revenue growth curves and things, but nobody could have possibly anticipated this reduction in revenue growth combined with 40 or 50 year highs in inflation rate, right? So to some extent, I think they made appropriate choices during the pandemic. To some extent, I think they overloaded on hiring and, and thought revenue growth was gonna be higher than it was. But I don't know the specifics of the data they have in the room at that time. And I'm always reluctant to substitute my own kind of decision making for others that were looking at different information at that moment in time. So do I think it's a continuing trend? Yes, I do. And do I think that it means that all these companies are ruined and the industry is going under? I don't. Oh, all right. So, yes. Wow. At outside lengths. Yeah, I was very upset about the number of emails I got from YouTube saying, you know, we're, we're going to take your video offline. We're going to remove these links and various other things that happen with respect to the algorithm. So I just want to try to play the game as best I'm able while not reducing the information that I get out there into the world. Uh, okay. Let's see what else we got. Miguel Hogue, people wanted Activision Blizzard to change. Layoffs suck, but to think this change would happen without any growing pains is naive at best. Now it's on Xbox. Better not trip up. Right. I don't think you have to just have blind faith that the Xbox team has made all the right decisions or that the future looks completely bright. And certainly when I say that Microsoft and Activision Blizzard King should be legal, that's really not a champion position. That's not a mandate that it should happen. I think these things should be legal because I like to encourage investment in these various areas. But yes, folks, unfortunately, we're always going to be affected by this on the ground like we saw yesterday. And so let's hope as gamers that Xbox and Microsoft wind up putting together a product pipeline that is efficient and makes high quality products that gets more and better stuff out to us to enjoy. Let's hope for that because we like video games and that's what we want, should want to see happen. Really? They did. They sent me emails over the last couple of weeks. And they don't like things that are silly, right? Like they got mad at me for an MSN link. I was like, well, I'm not sending you to the dark web on this stuff. I always look at these things first uh, and I incorporate them into my videos, but they were getting mad at me for silly things. So I said, all right, let's link out. Sardinisms, follow up. If Activision would have offered better severance prior to the merger, do you think Microsoft will slash should go by that instead of their own current policies? Well, I don't think they're going to be bound by Activision policies, but as a lawyer, that's different from the contractual commitments, right? I don't think Microsoft is going to go and anybody that has a, contra a contract that has a severance component in it and undermine that to, com to make it unified to the Microsoft set setting. But for the most part, people aren't going to have contractual severance. So I expect... Microsoft will offer things that comply with the law and with their overall policies. One of the things from a culture standpoint that Microsoft has to work through is trying to make sure that everybody is treated in at least a similar way so that they don't set precedents or morale issues with their own people, right? You still have the kind of whispers and problems with your own giant entity. If the new folks that just got bought get a huge package uh, and deal uh, and then you don't get that and you've been working at Microsoft for 20 years, right? So you have to balance all of these things 
That's why management has to talk about these things for long periods of time and deal with the ramifications. And it doesn't always come off as sounding genuine. I get that. I get the folks that criticize things like Phil Spencer's email or the fact that they didn't tell the employees first. There really is no good way to do a layoff of this size or really any size. But one of the things <clears throat> that the lawyers will try to do is avoid problems with leaks or security issues with folks that are going to be getting laid off. And so one of the things you often see happen is an announcement like this one or a leaked email like this one and a little bit later information to folks that are getting fired. And that's unfortunate. I think that that isn't necessarily the right way to handle things, but <clears throat> it is a way that companies often do because they are concerned, especially tech facing companies where people have access to code and things like that, that people could destroy the house as it were before they leave. Uh, and so there are folks that get concerned about those kinds of things. Chinchilla of Shrimp Fried Rice, thank you so much for doing so many good videos on this channel, Chinchilla. Sad, but I get very frustrated with people in games media saying, oh, it's capitalism's fault without looking at the laws that regulate capitalism in the U.S. and how they could be different. Right. Well, I don't, I don't think, unfortunately, that the big journalists in gaming are likely to have a lot more success analyzing capitalism's regulations in the United States versus other regulations in other jurisdictions uh, based on what I have seen so far of their output. And that is not trying to criticize them. It's not really what they get paid for knowing. Uh, but I don't think it's their wheelhouse, I will say. Uh, and I think there's a lot of voices in the gaming space, either making them or consuming them, that have very strong kind of more academic thoughts about economic systems. Uh, and that can inform not just the people that read the articles, but the people that write them. And so I don't want to see IGN talking about capitalism's faults or greatness because I don't think it would be a terribly illuminating article, but it might well make a heading out and headlines. So who knows? Is this part of the fact that gaming budgets are ballooning and sales are stagnant? Asks Terrence Popovich. Yes, I think it is. Uh, as part of uh, the Matthew Ball article and one, some of the things we can see around the industry, I think that is part of what is happening, most definitely. Leo Saunders asks, you have no guarantees. If you want a guarantee, go work the fields. Not even there, you have a guarantee. That's why we use pesticides to guarantee a certain outcome. Now, again, I think we can have sympathy for the folks affected, but I do want to underline this concept, right? We saw it in the message uh, uh, or in the article that we read about people not being friends of companies. And I'm a corporate lawyer. I'm, I'm explaining to you why these things happen. But if you are employed by an entity, it's important to understand <clears throat> that the mechanisms at work here don't necessarily make you a number, but they make you pretty close to one. So no matter what a corporation tells you, you're not their family. No matter what a company tells you, you're not their friends. If you've got another opportunity, if you, you should constantly be evaluating what your options are because at the end of the day, their obligation is to that pile of money. They have a fiduciary duty, a legal obligation to make that money grow and to be efficient about how they produce their products and services. So keep that in mind when you're making evaluations for your own life. And that's not legal advice. That's just life advice. I can't give legal advice in this context, but do evaluate those things on the understanding that a lot of companies want to make you feel warm and loved because people like to feel warm and loved, but it's not truly the case at the end of the day. All right. And if we've got any more questions or comments, I'm not seeing a ton of them. Let me know. Uh, and I will make sure to get to them. Here's one. Do you think the gaming journalism space is a bit of a disconnect between things like acquisitions and layoffs? The coverage of the Microsoft layoffs has been very anti-acquisition versus that of Riot. You know, the Riot layoffs that happened just before these are interesting because part of that story, of course, is that they had a $100 million settlement, I think it was, uh, with some of the sexual harassment and other complaints that were made by the state of California and folks working for Riot. And that kind of connects directly from my understanding uh, to where those layoffs come from, as well as the economy and what we're seeing. Uh, but yes, I think for the most part, when you look at gaming journalism's coverage of that, they view that as essentially just, right? Riot was a bad place to work, says the narrative. And these people were getting affected negatively. We got a big settlement from the company. And if layoffs are the cost, that's just that. But from an acquisition side of things, things are different, right? Activision gets bought. We don't necessarily love consolidation. We don't necessarily love acquisitions or capitalism or whatever you want to say, 
And so look at the effects of these things, 1,900 jobs lost. And they have folks like Senator Elizabeth Warren putting out tweets that say the FTC should have prevented this when it's very much not the ambit of the FTC Act or the antitrust laws to prevent things like labor loss. The, the law, economics, likes fewer jobs making the same amount of goods. So, yeah, I think it's complicated, but I don't think gaming journalism has their fingers on the pulse of these kinds of things, usually. Question, given the pace of this change, how far pre-merger do you think Microsoft was working out? What positions would be redundant? I think you do a cursory kind of overview, a 30,000 foot review when you are setting up the purchase and what the price is going to be early on. Uh, and then as you get into due diligence, which is essentially reviewing contracts and reviewing setup uh, and the various people involved in making the products or services for the company you're buying, you evaluate those things, you get reports from some of the heads uh, of what they think they can do. And, and this is when you give the orders to say, we think we're gonna need to reduce this by 8% or whatever it might be. Uh, and then you spend three months kind of evaluating these things and how you want to present the message to both the employees and the public. Uh, and so I think how far pre-merger? The answer is not so far for pre-merger. Remember, this happened very quickly. Activision was purchased in essentially a fire sale as its stock price was plummeting over the lawsuit from the state of California, which ultimately wound up not being what it was advertised as. They wound up suing and winning, well, settling over uh, discrimination in pay that was not really systemic as far as the settlement said, and we talked about that here in Virtual Legality, and not the Cosby Suite and those various other things. So it was always a weird kind of setup that Activision wind up getting purchased anyway. And so there's a lot going on there that you can unwind that's probably longer form than even a video like this one. Since ABK had a very toxic culture before the merger, do you think another shoe will drop with another set of employee cuts? I, I mean, I don't know whether or not this set of cuts included folks they might've found as bad actors. It's not really clear exactly what bad actors remained in the company after the various lawsuits and things were happening with respect to the EEOC in the state of California. So it's possible. Certainly, you should never assume that a company is just going to run exactly as it has today, tomorrow. But I don't think it's necessarily the case that we can expect a big set soon. It seems like Microsoft took everything that they might want to do in the near term and put it all on one day. Joshua Ford says, we are reaching the end of the major graphical improvement arc of video games, it seems. I tend to agree. Now it's all about things like ray tracing that should make development easier, yet the costs still go up. I tend to think on a management decision level, right, as a video game fan, that too much emphasis has been put on photorealism and open worlds and huge designs that cost hundreds of millions of dollars. I tend to like the Nintendo games that are linear and well thought out and have new design elements just as much as those giant bloated uh, RPGs or action adventures. And so I think what we might wind up seeing as part of this is not just layoffs, hopefully layoffs start to taper down very soon, but reductions in scope, right? One of the favorite games that journalists have put out there and that I've enjoyed this year has been the Prince of Persia Lost Crown game that Ubisoft put out, which is instead of a giant far cry open world, a linear Metroidvania type game that clearly is lower in scope than most of what Ubisoft puts out into the world. And so I would like to see more successes of those type of games. I think as the video game fan base gets older, has more life commitments and family commitments, that that might be more attractive to more people in and of itself. And that some of this will be self-correcting, but only with management that really pays attention to what the market is doing and what they can affordably provide. What kind of redundancies are usually cut in such mergers? Here, a lot of PR managers seem to have been fired, but also in development, games that overlap with games existing on Xbox already. So that's a kind of portfolio culling. I, I'm not sure whether the untitled survival game was cut because it was too similar to Minecraft or some of the other things we've seen reported out there, or whether it was just in a little bit of development hell. Remember, Microsoft as a company is one that is a little bit burned last year by letting ZeniMax and Bethesda just go off and do their own thing and wound up with the release of Redfall, which was a game they released last spring and didn't have very good reviews. And I'll, honestly, is a game that has a lot of things that should be interesting that just winds up being pretty boring. And I think 
anytime you see companies do things, they're often a reference to the things they've learned in the recent past. I see this a lot in contracts, right? So I negotiate and draft contracts for companies. And one of the things that happens the most often is something bad happens and then they want the contract to cover that bad thing into the future. So if you get delivered a contract from another from another party, one of the things that you can usually see is like a past history, almost like an archaeological dig of the ways that they got burned by vendors or whatever else kind of contract you're looking at. And that often happens with the way companies operate as well. So I suspect the way Microsoft is now kind of uh, bringing Activision Blizzard King into the family is different than the way they brought in ZeniMax, not just because of the size, but because they want to take a sterner hand to how the company goes about making products and services because they now realize that it reflects very much on the Microsoft brand itself in a way that they might not have realized before Arcane's release of Redfall last year. So they, they learn lessons, they do things differently. Are they the right lessons? We'll have to see. Question, do you expect Microsoft to further lay off people this year or is this just a one-time thing? Also, the cancellation of the game, in, in my opinion, is ambiguous because we could have another Redfall issue. Right, yes, and that's exactly what I just said. I don't expect Microsoft to have planned out further layoffs in the near term, in the immediate term. Could they be looking at potential layoffs in a given quarter uh, in Q3 or Q4 of this year? Perhaps. Uh, we don't know. But a lot of that is reactions to the economy and what we're going to see in sales. Like that's part of the job is to really just monitor what's working and what's not working and be able to try to be flexible to avoid those icebergs. Uh, so I'm, I'm sure they're not guaranteeing that there are not layoffs coming. I'm sure they're not guaranteeing that everybody will have their job forever and ever. But I don't anticipate that they are expecting to need one right now. They seem to have gone and torn off the bloody Band-Aid yesterday in an effort to not have to do it again in, in the near future. Question, since ABK had a very toxic culture before the merger, do you think another... Oh, I, I already answered this one. Sorry about that. Katie says, follow up to Sardinism's question on redundancy plans. Do you think three, six, or 12 months from final purchase on the departments and positions? I don't fully understand the questions, but in terms of whether or not there'll be more firings, I think in general, you've seen the, the first big cuts. I think they're likely to be the most significant cuts Generally speaking, there might be reevaluations at things like the six and 12 month periods, the quarterly marks, as I said before, uh, but I would expect them if they exist to be lesser in volume. But again, everybody has to be flexible as to whether or not the games are selling, whether or not people are buying, whether or not the production pipeline is succeeding. And part of what was always a little bit dangerous and fraught about purchasing something like Activision Blizzard King is... Can Xbox even run a giant publisher in connection with all of the other companies that it's recently purchased or already runs? And that's a continuing question that I hope is answered in positive, but I can't guarantee that at all. All right. And I think we might just be concluded with our video here to talk about um, these layoffs. And again, if you take nothing else from this video, take the fact that these are people, they are affected just because the law and economics says that this is probably the right thing for the company to have done and they're justified and not evil to do it doesn't make it any less of a traumatic event for the people that continue to work at that company or the people that have been laid off. So keep that in mind, go out there with kindness, respect and love. And I know you will because that's the, the community that we have here. But just because things make sense from a business perspective doesn't mean they make sense for the individuals that are affected. All right. And then we have a couple more questions. How does Microsoft expect to reasonably sustain Activision Blizzard under the same economic model for games, for rent? How will they continue to grow studios? Your guess is as good as mine. I They would have modeled out what they want to do with the Activision assets when they made the purchase. And the price would have been inclusive of how they thought they could be used to make games. But the world that it exists right now is distinct from the world that existed when they made those initial models. So some of the things are going to need to be adjusted. I expect that they will incorporate them a little bit more succinctly into the Microsoft family than kind of leaving ZeniMax and Bethesda out to do their own thing as they did for many years and are still kind of doing right now. So we'll see. They've been reorganizing their gaming department for the last couple of years. 
And Phil Spencer has a really tough job ahead of him. And I hope he succeeds because that gets us more and better games, all of us. So let's root for him, okay? Question, do you think these layoffs will stop other companies like Sony from making a buy like a, a Square Enix that has been rumored? I imagine an acquisition of that size doing harm to a smaller company like Sony. Well, I don't think Sony has enough cash on hand to buy a company like Square Enix. I could be wrong there. Uh, but let's say that they did. I don't think that these layoffs or what happens during a merger would prevent a company from doing what they think is right with their assets. So just like we talked about the management having to be responsible for efficiencies of that pile of money after the merger, the people that make the decision to enter into that merger have to be responsible for the efficiencies of that pile of money. And so if Sony is looking at Square Enix, thinks they have a clear economic win in buying them, even if they would have to call some redundancies as a part of that purchase, then it's incumbent upon management of Sony to try to make that purchase happen. But I don't know that it will ever look that way. And I think Square right now is happy to have a very close relationship with Sony with the occasional game going on to Xbox. And maybe Sony's concerned about that, but I don't know whether they are or not. And now we've got people in the chat talking about what the best console is. I have them all. I like all the consoles. CMBR, Hogla, for what it's worth from recent SEC filings, Sony doesn't have cash on hand, but should be able to easily raise the necessary capital. That's fair, but certainly a capital raise is, is a dilutive event to the existing equity holders and is something that you have to consider as to whether or not it's worth it for the asset that may or may not be on the market. I mean, we talk about Square Enix as if they want to sell, but it always takes two to tango, and we don't know whether they'd be interested in selling to someplace like Sony and losing that particular bit of independence. So maybe, maybe not. I don't know. Sony is going to face a juggernaut in Microsoft and their companies. And if they get that pipeline working, it's going to be a very intimidating one. But we'll see whether or not that ever happens. I certainly hope that it does for the sake of gamers and for the sake of gaming. So anyone else before we pop off for the day, thank you so much for being here and having these conversations. I think they're so important to have better explanations out there in the world of these things, I fully understand everybody that's upset and angered by what they're seeing. 2,000 people is a lot of people. Uh, and I really hope that folks aren't out there either making fun of the people that lost their jobs or using it as console war bait because that's not what we like to see here in virtual legality. That's not what I'm hoping folks do with the tweets that I make or the messages that I send out, although I do see some of that sometime. So... Please do go out there with love and understanding, love and respect, as the easy allies used to say. I think they might still say it, uh, but I really appreciate everyone for having this conversation with me. Thank you so much for supporting the channel, for giving me your questions and comments, and hopefully this was all illuminating. Uh, I feel very badly for the po people that were affected. For those of you that are wondering, I can say, and I should have disclosed this at the start of the video, my brother, Tom Hogue, who you see on Two Hogues Are Better Than One from time to time, is employed at Cinemax Online Studios. He continues to be employed at Cinemax Online Studios as of today. So I'm very happy to say that. I'm happy for the other people that reached out to me over the last couple of days that said what they were dealing with over at Activision and, and uh, other places. So thank you so much for that. And I will see you on the next episode of Virtual Legality. Virtual Legality is a YouTube video series with audio podcast versions presented as commentary and for education and entertainment purposes only. It does not constitute legal advice and does not create an attorney-client relationship. If you have legal questions about the topics discussed, please consult your own legal counsel.